by a show of hands, who in the audience has been affected by cancer, has been a caregiver, or knows someone who has cancer? Wow. Like many of you, I too have someone in my life who's been affected by cancer. Back in 2013, my cousin Karthik received admission into a top flight research university in Great Britain to obtain his PhD. He was so excited. Not knowing any friends or family, he got on a plane alone to embark on the next step of his academic journey. Within a few weeks of Karthik settling into his new life in Great Britain, he noticed some weakness in his right arm and started having difficulties in simple tasks, such as brushing his teeth and taking notes in class. Worried, he sought out medical advice, and soon enough, the university physicians had diagnosed him with cancer. I remember how devastated Karthik sounded when he called to tell me the bad news. The only thing that crossed my mind was what his younger brother was feeling, thinking about the possibility of losing his hero and best friend. All alone, 5,000 miles away from his family, in a country that he barely knew, Karthik started his long fight against cancer, beginning with an aggressive round of chemotherapy. As Karthik entered into his long battle with cancer in Great Britain, I was then entering into a new phase of my life, the seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone has that favorite class and favorite teacher in middle school, and for me, that was Mrs. Susan Hanbury in seventh grade biology. The information-packed lectures and hands-on experiments had, for the first time, exposed me to the wonders of plant science and botany at the ripe age of 11. This initial exposure opened my eyes to the possibilities of nature and science, very quickly leading to an internship at the Department of Plant Biotechnology at Fort Valley State University. I was only left to shadow and watch various experiments taking place during my first year at the lab. But my desire to actually perform the experiments I was seeing, to do the things I was observing, led to an invitation to come back the following year to pursue a research project of my own. The following year, I conducted my first official set of experiments in the plant reproductive biology field. Oh boy, let me tell you, that was a mess. The number of plants I killed, the number of glass beakers I broke, and the number of tools I misplaced. Anyway, so during this project, I discovered why two medicinal plants are going extinct in nature which is actually a really fun project. While performing these experiments, I also learned numerous other skills and techniques, such as tissue culture, scanning electron microscopy, southern blotting, and PCR. And, not to mention, the most crucial skills of picking up broken glassware and disposing of dead plants. <laughs> I thought I was the luckiest person on this earth to have at my fingertips all of this cutting edge scientific instrumentation. Throughout all of this, thoughts of Karthik's battle with cancer in Great Britain constantly hovered in the back of my mind. One of the plants I worked with at the time was known as Bacoba mineri, which is found all over the world. It's killed as a weed and regarded as a nuisance in many parts of the globe. But do you know what else is regarded as a nuisance but has far deadlier consequences? Glioblastoma multiforme also known as GBM. Now, if you've heard of this deadly form of brain cancer, it's because it's the same disease that has taken the lives of Bo Biden, former Vice President Joe Biden's son, as well as former Senator Ted Kennedy. GBM is also the same cancer that current Senator John McCain has recently been diagnosed with. This disease does not discriminate between the old and the young, or anywhere in between. So let me tell you a little bit more about GBM. It is the most aggressive and deadliest form of cancer found in the brain. GBM patients have an average survival time ranging from seven to 15 months, and there are very limited effective treatments available. Imagine someone being told by their doctor that they have GBM. And even with the best treatments available, they only have 15 months to live. Imagine that long ride home telling their parents, telling their spouse, telling their kids. Now imagine that there's a plant out there, a simple weed that could potentially be used to treat this lethal disease. And that is exactly where Bacoba mineri comes back into play. 
How did I draw a relationship between GBM and Bacoba? The answer lies in my plant research days at Fort Valley State. It was there that I learned about terpenoids, a group of organic compounds found in the plants I was researching at the lab. Many of these compounds have been shown to have beneficial effects on human ailments. For example, numerous terpenoids have been shown to have anti-cancer properties on a host of various cancer cell types. Specifically, a terpenoid known as Bacicide A has been shown to be present in Bacoba minerae, the plant which I've been working with over the past few years. Then it clicked. So I had to actually perform this experiment. So to do this, I discussed an experimental framework uh, with my mentors. And the hypothesis I reached to was that since Bacoba minerae contains terpenoids such as Bacicide A, and such terpenoids have been shown to have anti-tumor properties, perhaps Bacoba minerae could also exhibit anti-tumor properties on GBM brain tumor cells. To test the experiment, after discussing this experimental framework with my mentors at Fort Valley State and Carmanos Cancer Institute, I developed a project procedure. The actual experimentation was done in two major series of steps. Step one was to actually produce a leaf extract from Bacoba minerae at Fort Valley State. Essentially, I walked over to the greenhouse, harvested leaves from the plants of Bacoba minerae, and produced a crude leaf extract. Step two was to actually apply this extract onto the GBM brain tumor cells. Now, I couldn't just uh, sprinkle some Bacoba powder onto some GBM cells. Rather, there was a complex application process, which involved culturing GBM cells, creating and diluting working solutions of Bacoba, applying diluted solutions of Bacoba onto GBM cells, and finally, obtaining results through a WST1 tetrazone reduction assay and microplate photometer reading. <laughs> 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 now, I know that may have sounded like quite the mouthful, but in reality, it was a logical sequence of steps that optimized applying such an extract onto tumor cells. During all of this, I had no foresight or expectations going into the project. And to be completely honest with you, the whole process was extremely tiring. There are many long days and nights spent with the full understanding that all of this work could yield no results. But on that sunny summer day, on that moment, when I viewed the results of the experiment under the plate reader machine, I saw that the extract of this plant, Bacoba minerae, that nuisance weed we kill all over the world, actually inhibited the proliferation of these deadly GBM brain tumor cells. <laughs> This was a finding that has never before been reported or published in previous scientific literature. I couldn't believe it. I remember standing there in pure disbelief, staring at the computer screen in front of me. Is this real? Am I imagining this? Were the first two thoughts to cross my mind, and I had an immediate urge to share this good news with my research mentors and my family. So I picked up the phone and called my dad. Yeah, I know, okay. What sane teenager actually calls and talks to their dad? <laughs> Anyway, so I told my dad, Dad, it worked, jumping up and down in sheer joy. Calm down, calm down. What worked, he asked, completely confused both by my words and by the mere fact that I had called him. <laughs> <laughs> the extract, the extract from the plant Bacoba minerae, I said. It actually shrunk and stopped the growth of these deadly GBM brain tumor cells. But I knew that even though this news was truly exciting, it was only the first step of many that would be needed to take this initial research into clinical testing. This was only the beginning. Although many more hours and tests in the lab are needed, I'm truly optimistic that with further research, Bacoba minerae has the potential to be developed into a novel treatment option targeting GBM. This brings me back to my cousin Karthik. He received conventional chemotherapy for many months, but I'm happy to share that he successfully won his battle and is now a cancer survivor. <laughs> like Bacoba, there's many other hidden gifts out there in nature that we as a human society can harness in order to fight many of our diseases. For example, we've already taken the willow tree and produced a crucial everyday medication known as aspirin, or the foxglove plant, 
from which we produce digoxin, a crucial heart medication. Nature so graciously offers us a plethora of compounds that can be used in treating our diseases, and all we have to do is look. It's truly unbelievable how some of the things that can be found in our own backyards, things that we disregard on a daily basis, have the power to change lives around the world. And maybe, just maybe, one day, deadly diseases such as glioblastoma multiforme can be treated using a simple weed like Bacoba mineri. And as Amelia Barr, a British novelist, once said, it is always the simple that produces the marvelous. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>